Welcome, everyone, to the Asian Voices Radio podcast, where you'll find real Asian American conversations, including all the topics you are too afraid to ask your Asian parents. I'm your host, Linda Schwartz. Our guest joining us today is Emmanuel Han, a documentary photographer and director. As a Korean third culture kid growing up in Singapore and Cambodia, he developed an interest in storytelling, especially on topics of identity, culture, diasporic experiences, and the question of what it means to belong. His deep observational and listening abilities have led him to tell the stories of the coffee farmers in Colombia, Chinese grocery store owners in the Mississippi Delta, and the Korean Uzbeks in Brooklyn, and most recently, the Koreatown community in Los Angeles through his photo book, Koreatown Dreaming. Hello, Emmanuel, and welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi, Linda. Thanks for having me on. I'm doing well today. Great. I'm really happy to hear that. And I'm really excited to have you on the show. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? And um, I understand that you grew up in Singapore and Cambodia. And I'm always interested to know what your childhood was like. What was it like growing up there? Yeah, I think my childhood involved a lot of moving and constant change. I was born in Saipan. And at the age of four, our family moved to Singapore. And after another four years, we moved to Cambodia. And after another four years, my brother and I moved back to Singapore, where we attended middle and high school. And so at every moment, there was always this idea of change. And I think because of the constant moving, I never felt like I was settled anywhere. And then I think to add on top of that, the fact that I was Korean by ethnicity and American by nationality, but lived in a third culture like Singapore and Cambodia and Saipan. Um, It just, it was, um, it was even more unusual in the sense that I had to constantly reckon with my identity and my place in those places that I lived in. And so even in Singapore, where it's such a cosmopolitan and multicultural place, I was always exposed to different cultures and, and I would wonder, do I belong here? Um, And same thing in Cambodia, where my parents were missionaries, and they still are to this day. Um, And I think kind of moving through all these different countries with very different socioeconomic conditions, um, stages of development, and obviously um, different pasts and histories. For for instance, in the example of Cambodia, where they had um, one of the most atrocious genocides in the world, I think at each point, I think there was a lot of learning and attempting to understand the culture, even as a young kid. And I think because of my parents' work where it involved um, or it required them to understand the histories of those countries, I think they were very proactive in educating us um, as to, you know, what happened. And I think because of that um, and being exposed to so many different ways of life, I think I just became curious about different people in different countries um, and different places. Um, And yeah, I suppose my childhood was very unusual compared to the average person. Yeah. And so how did your curiosities lead you into the work that you're doing now? Yeah, I actually took a really winding path to storytelling. Um, So for a lot of my childhood and schooling, um, everything was kind of geared towards a more professional track. Um, So I studied the humanities in high school, and I suppose that's kind of where I first learned, um, or I I guess I first discovered um, an interest in what it means to be human. But that was kind of pushed aside when I went to NYU for um, a finance major and graduated with a finance degree and worked in tech for two years. And I think like early on, I was not really exposed to the arts, and I didn't consider a career in the arts as something that was possible. And I thought very practically in terms of like, oh, I'm going to get a good job. Maybe I'll start a company and maybe, you know, I'll just kind of be self-sustaining because the other way that I grew up was very poor. And I, I wanted this sense of like control and, and sustainability in my own life financially. Um, and over time, I, I guess I, I just couldn't resist the fact that I, I loved reading stories and that um, there was something about storytelling that really pulled me. And the way that I sort of entered into that um, that field is was through photography. 
Um, so when I was in college, I was kind of dabbling in photography as a hobby. And when I was studying abroad, I would kind of photograph all the places I visited. And yeah, and I guess just over the years, I just honed my craft. And at a certain point, um, about two years into my first job out of college, I decided to quit and try photography full time and go freelance. Um, I probably had like a thousand or two thousand dollars in my bank account, but I just really went for it. Um, and I just kind of told myself, like, I'll give myself a year. And if I can't make it in photography, I'll just go back to tech, which didn't seem that hard at that point. Um, and I guess even within my journey in photography, it started off very commercial, just kind of paying the bills. And then over time, I worked on a couple of projects that really solidified this idea of like, wow, I can just go places and tell stories and that I, you know, it, it's just accessible. And also just kind of seeing the impact of that and people like learning about different communities and just being really um, interested in those stories. Um, it just gave me a lot of validation. Yeah. I mean, it must have been really scary to step out on your own and venture out into uh, the unknown, especially in the arts. Like there's all, there's like this construct in society that says, you know, you can never make money in, in, in your chosen field, especially if it's art. So um, what was your mindset going into that? I mean, you talked a little bit about it, but can you expand a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, um, it was just really, uh, I don't know. It was just kind of like, I, I just believed that I could do it. <laughs> I guess, I guess a lot of creatives have this sense of like confidence in themselves. Um, like the belief that, that you can just make it happen. And I think like I, I did take some practical steps, you know, I just, I made sure that um, my, my costs were low, that I wasn't spending more than I earned, you know, kind of like basic things like that. Um, and I guess a lot of people point out that I do have a finance degree, so it's not a foreign concept to me of like, to, you know, to stay in the black, so to speak. Um, that just sounded really nerdy. But um, I think for me, I kind of had this very uh, practical approach for the first few years where I kind of pursued more of the commercial side of photography because I knew that was where the money was. And I do think like a lot of artists struggle or give up because they haven't found a way to maintain that financial solv solvency. And for me, I guess I, I was kind of lucky in the sense that I came from the tech world. And so early on in my career, I just did a lot of gigs for tech companies, whether it was shooting headshots or shooting events. I did some wedding photography. And I think over the years, as I improved in my craft and improved my network, um, I was getting you know better gigs. And that eventually gave me the freedom to pursue some of these more documentary projects out of my own pocket. Um, yeah, and, and I think the first real project that kind of was a pivotal moment in my life was when my friend Andrew and I went down to the Mississippi Delta and documented the Chinese community. And that was just like a pure passion project. We, you know, poured our own money into it. We bought our flights. We even just like reached out to those people directly. And once we had all the photos, we kind of packaged it into a story and we pitched it to the New York Times and they ran it. And that was kind of like, wow, like you can just go out there, work on something and, you know, the news will run it, <laughs> you know. So it was really validating to go through that experience. The thought of taking that initiative and taking a chance on yourself in that way is always scary, but obviously like it worked out for you. And did that project lead to other ones? Can you talk a little bit more about how the coffee farmers um, story came, came to you? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, going back a little bit, the, the project in the Mississippi Delta, it was almost just like the story was too good. And sometimes when you just, when you just see like how good a story is, it, it's just like the story hooks you in, you know, like, and you become a slave to it, so to speak, like you just have to do it. And I think maybe that is just like a creative mindset. And because I had, done this sort of documentary project um there was a nonprofit that wanted to do a little documentary about coffee farmers in colombia in 2019 um because back then the world uh the world market prices for coffee was at an all-time low and so the people that were hurt the most were the the coffee pickers in colombia and colombia is the third largest coffee producer in the world and really like the distributors were fine, the retailers were fine, but the people that were hurt the most were the coffee farmers because they were at the mercy of world um, coffee farm prices. And so this nonprofit um, hired me 
to travel down to the coffee region in Colombia, which is also just incredibly beautiful. And yeah, we just interviewed farmers, um, many of whom were also migrants from Venezuela when um, there was that mass migration out of Venezuela. And so, yeah, we were just photographing, talking to them. And I don't know, I think like I work best when I'm sort of in an environment and like I just see what's happening and I'm just like kind of a fly on the wall and I try not to be too intrusive and I just kind of observe and I try to find good stills. And um, yeah, I mean, that was kind of a dream project, to be honest. Like it, it touches on the social and economic issue. It's in a gorgeous landscape one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to and it's also about coffee which I love and <laughs> yeah that that was just kind of all the 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 pieces kind of fitting nicely together yeah it sounds like there's been a lot of serendipitous moments in your career that you know just one thing leading to another and um but before we you know go on to the next thing I I'm I am a real crypto fan and we can, we don't have to talk about it but <laughs> Um, just quickly though, before we move on, I'm dying to know like what your thoughts on crypto is. Damn. Uh, is it, is it <laughs> you saw on my LinkedIn that I worked at a, at a crypto exchange? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, right out of college, my first job was working at this, um, Bitcoin exchange. It was called ItBit at the time. Now they've rebranded to Paxos. Um, and the guy who hired me, he actually was my former boss at an internship. And so I was kind of brought in to be this sort of like generalist chief of staff, um, to help scale the company. And we did, um, when I joined, I was employee number three and we got to like 60 before I left and started doing photography. But, you know, my, my ideas on crypto back then, um, are still consistent now, which is that I don't believe in it as a currency, not in the way that we understand fiat currency. Sure, and sure, even sure. back then, um, I think there was this, this understanding of Bitcoin as kind of like a store of value, like this almost speculative asset. Although back then in 2014, the price was hovering at $600 for two years. Um, so I, I bought in at $600 and I sold at $600 before I left, you know, to pursue photography because I had to buy gear. Um, so, you know, my life could have turned out very differently. Completely and different. Could have been retired by now, but, um, but I... <laughs> I'm That's right. Now you're now you're working on your passions and you're, you know, and there's something to be said though about creating something from nothing mm -hmm. and going after your dream and pursuing it with a drive and a passion that is born out of just curiosity and interest. And that's what it sounds to me like you did. And I mean, you know, the work that you have done and are doing, I'd love to touch on this current project that you're working on, the Koreatown Dreaming. Like, how did that come to be? Yeah, I think um, the Koreatown Dreaming project honestly came to be very organically. Um, I moved from New York to LA in November 2020 in the height of the pandemic. And one of the reasons I moved was because I wanted to work in film and I still do. And when I arrived in Los Angeles, you know, everything was closed. So, you know, there was not a lot that I could do. I couldn't network, I couldn't work. Um, so I was just, you know, kind of collecting unemployment and thinking about ways to stay busy and sort of productive in my photo career. And one of the things that I sort of like told myself I would do is to give myself a little project to work on. And so for all of December in 2020, my goal was to just get myself to Koreatown, park somewhere, and then just kind of walk around. And initially, the idea was that I would capture some of the architecture of Koreatown, because I'm fascinated by how like stuck in time, it seems to me, like if you walk through certain parts of Koreatown, it really feels like nothing has changed since the 90s. Um, and so that's how it started. I just kind of started walking around Koreatown and I was like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Like, that's a cool sign. Um, and eventually I think I got bored of just being outside. So I walked in to some of the stores and I started talking to the shop owners. And often I would just be the only person in the entire store or like even the entire building. Um, and so I started talking to the, to, to one of this, uh, shop owner early on and, you know, she just kind of opened up. Like she just talked about her life, her kids, her dreams her past and like this entire journey. And I was just kind of like, you know, I was just really uh, captured by her story. And so I just kept listening. And at the end, I asked her if I could photograph her. 
And she agreed, but she agreed to just one photo. And so I took it on my film camera and, you know, thank God it came out. Um, and really that was the first photo that became the series. I had collected a bunch of these stories and I was kind of sitting on them and I wasn't really sure what to do with them. But one day I decided to share them on Instagram. And the moment I did, I felt like a lot of people just responded really well to it. And, you know, I think people who had grown up in Koreatown or people who were just really interested in Koreatown, they just responded and they said, wow, this just reminds me of like when I grew up or um, I'm just really glad that someone is telling these stories. And so that made me think like, oh, there's something here that it wasn't just me who felt like I had, you know, sat in on something special, but there, there was a wider audience basically who wanted to learn more about the stories of Koreatown. And I think like one of the things that I think about, or one of the things that I was thinking about while making that project was I was thinking a lot about my parents and how for such a big part of my life, like I just didn't know what their lives were like, um, at least when they were younger. Um, I mean, obviously we know how our parents are when we're growing up with them in, in a more familial sense, but like we don't know too much about what their hopes and dreams were like or what they were thinking about when they were in their 20s and 30s and really the struggles of what they had to go through. And so all those thoughts were in the back of my head when I continued reaching out and just showing up to places with my camera being like, hey, I'm working on this project, like, would you be interested in participating? And so that's kind of how it went. Um, over time, I was just working and working. I reached about 10 to 20 photos. And at that point, I think I that was when I felt like, oh, I can make a book out of this. Because initially, I was trying not to, um, because there was, it was going to be so much work. And it was supposed to be the side thing. And then over time, I think I, I just felt like, oh, this is the right time um, during the pandemic. Um, and also like in 2021, when there was a rise in anti Asian hate crimes, I just felt like, oh, these stories become even more important. And like, I think people just have to know that. And so, yeah, I, the, the photography continued. I ended up shooting 40 different small businesses. Um, and then I raised some money on Kickstarter and found a printer in Hong Kong, worked with a designer to get the book done. And yeah, the books arrived in the middle of March this year. That sounds like a really phenomenal project, isn't it? Like what just came forward for me while you were sharing that is, isn't it interesting how when you get an idea for something or start working on something, how just the process of being in the creative aspect of it and doing the work makes itself want to manifest through you. Like there's no other person that this project could have manifest through. It always surprises me that like no one from LA has made a project like this before. And I always kind of joke that like it really took a New Yorker to come to LA to tell the stories of Kirby Town. But I think there is something about like just seeing things from a fresh perspective, you know, like I'm I'm I was a new kind of visitor almost to LA and like everything that I saw was like with fresh eyes and everything was interesting to me. Like even the oldest kind of like um, you know, like slightly run down sign for a store was just like, oh my God, this is precious. Like I, I want to know more, you know, like everything felt nostalgic to me, even though I didn't grow up in LA. And I think I maybe sensed this sort of like spirit of Koreatown that, that I could sort of tap into because I was a Korean person. And even though I wasn't from LA, I could just, you know, feel it in my bones of like this, the, the flavor and the essence of it. And I think I, yeah, there was really good momentum as well. I think just the fact that I shot the first few stories and shared them and, and then there was this kind of galvanizing energy that came from the community. And I really don't think I could have finished the project without the community support um, because I, I tend to get in my head and I tend to get you know discouraged really quickly. But I, I could just see how much it meant to the people who were following the journey. And just like people reaching out on Instagram being like, hey, like that was my my dad's cousin or like that was my friend's friend's father or something like that. And and I was like, yeah, like I'm surprised that no one has. I mean, I'm sure there are people who have. Um, and, and I know for sure that there's a lot of um, stories that have been preserved by the Korean press. Um, but that's, you know, in a language that's not very accessible to the second generation. And so it just 
you know, like I, I think I found the meaning as I was working on the project. It wasn't like I was trying to do this grand thing of like recording histories. All I was trying to do was like tell individual stories. And then over time, when I look back, it, be- it became this collective history. And I think like maybe that's the thing that I didn't, I didn't even realize when I was making it was that I was creating um, a historical document. And I think that's the thing that I, I, I find a lot of satisfaction in. Um, obviously the aesthetic parts and just the storytelling parts are great, but like the fact that this can be a record of people who lived in LA and kind of built it up to what it is today. Um, so while I was working on the book, I actually met someone and I, and she was undocumented and it was really kind of eye opening for me to learn about the undocumented community in Koreatown. And so I ended up working on a short documentary with her to just kind of tell her life story and what it's like to be Asian American and undocumented. Um, I think people kind of tend to gloss over the fact that there are 15% um, of the Asian American population that are undocumented. And so that was one of the most meaningful projects that I did to kind of be able to tell this story, this extremely personal family story and how being undocumented impacted them. And that's an area that I that I want to explore a bit more. Um, so, in line with this, und, um, so in line with this documentary, um, I'm writing a short film that's about a similar experience that that I hope to make into a short film soon. Well, that's a beautiful story, and I'm really glad that you're that I'm hearing this and that you're having the opportunity to share it with with us. Um, I w- wanted to ask you mentioned something about your parents, like not knowing their past, not knowing their stories. Have you had a chance to connect with them and to learn, to learn that aspect of, of their lives? Yeah. I think as I get older, I am starting to learn more about them. Um, I would say it's like collecting little nuggets that over time kind of create a a fuller story. Um, But I think like one of the big, or I guess one of like the ways that I grew up that was different from other people was that my brother and I grew up by ourselves from age 12 and 13. Um, so both of us, um, grew up in Singapore and our parents basically rented out an apartment for us. And so we had to raise ourselves. (laughs) I I guess that's a very uncommon way to grow up to put, put it mildly. And I, I think, so there was this additional layer of like not being around my parents. And so like an additional layer of like not knowing what they were like, and so it, it almost like took 10 years after for us to become adults to reconnect with them at a different level, because when we were kind of left alone, like we were kids. And I think when, you know, like I have two older brothers, but like when all three of us kind of grew up, like, I guess our relationship to our parents changed and we kind of started to see them more as adults and peers rather than like this sort of like vaunted for this like vaunted kind of figure and so whenever i travel with my mom um you know i'll ask her certain things and you know it's 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 a process i think like even though we're older i think they still see us as kids and there are certain things that i'm sure they don't feel as comfortable sharing um and also like i guess maybe you know there are a lot of um emotional things that are tied up with it as well um but yeah, I think over time I've I've become a, a bit more proactive in asking questions, and I think now when we have phone conversations, we can kind of broach topics that maybe feel uncomfortable, um, but they always offer kind of like a unique insight into like who they are as people, and in, in a weird way, or I guess maybe it's not so weird, but like you start to see how how you're so alike to them, even though you might not have grown up with them, like certain beliefs or mannerisms that you just that you just kind of inherit. I'd be so interested in seeing your story. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose that'll happen at some point in my life. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, to be honest, I, I, I think I'm, I'm not ready, not, not in like an emotional sense, but I don't think I have all the, the information, yeah. you know, to make something yeah. like that. But it, it is probably like one of the most important things I'll make in my Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Um, I'm just waiting <laughs> for the right time and place to make it, I think. And I think it'll be a film, um, but who knows exactly I, I, what that'll look like. Yeah, I can't wait for that because 
you've just uncovered so many different layers and aspects of yourself that are so intriguing and so interesting. I mean, um, I'm just, I can't wait, but we're coming up at the top of our time together. And I just wanted to thank you for being on the show. Um, can you share with us where people can find you, your socials, your website? Yeah. So, um, you can purchase a book on the website, which is koreatowndreaming.com. Just spelled out, um, you know, nothing fancy. Um, if you're in LA, it's also in select bookstores like Now Serving, uh, Chevalier's, Skylight, and some other, and of course, Kim's Home Center, which is one of the sponsors of the book. Um, they have one of the largest inventories. Um, you can find more of my work on my Instagram, which is at Hanbo, H-A-H-N-B-O. And you can also see more of my work on my website, which is just emmanuelhan.com. I want to thank our guest, Emmanuel Han, for joining us today. If you have any suggestions for future guests or topics, we'd love to hear from you. Also, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Asian Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers our API community with a voice through media arts. If you would like to support our program and make a donation, please visit AsianVoicesRadio.com. And thank you for listening. I'm Linda Schwartz. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Voices radio show. Until then, take care, everyone. Bye now. Bye.